welcome to Broadview, especially uh, family of Hannah and uh, Josh. Lovely to have you all here uh, on this special occasion and, and to all of our usuals and any other visitors. Welcome indeed. Uh, we're really glad to have you here. So my name's Michael. Um, I came with my three blessings this morning who have thoroughly blessed me this morning. Uh, but anyway, we're here and we're, we're going to focus in. So um, yeah, look, today we're going to continue on the series that we've been doing based on the, uh, uh, the TV series Breaking Bad, uh, where we look for parallels between the gospel and uh, the deconstruction of Walter White. Um, I'm actually just kidding. I heard that Rachel was worried people would confuse Breaking Bread with Breaking Bad, and as soon as I knew that, I had to put it in, so... Anyway, our series is called Breaking Bread, and uh, we're looking at the meals of Jesus from the book of Luke. Uh, I've heard someone once quoted as saying that in Luke, Jesus always seems to be either eating or either on the way to or on the way from a meal. Um, Sounds like a pretty good story to me. Uh, And I'm pleased to report that after recent talks that I have done out the front here involving groin, tumours and foreskins, I have a passage without any awkward anatomy today. Before you all get too excited, uh, I'm still going to be a bit of a Debbie Downer, as this is one of the more awkward meal stories discussed in Luke. It's pretty heavy going, um, so please feel free to laugh heartily when the opportunities present, even if they're terrible dad jokes. Um, You're going to need it. It's going to be a bit of a rough ride, but we're going to get there. So, who's been to an awkward dinner party? Everyone, surely? Yes? Yes. that weird uncle attends, someone makes an unexpected silence-inducing announcement, a fight erupts, people leave. I was going to get someone to volunteer their awkward stories, but um, I remembered we're being videotaped today, so I'll spare you that. So, without further ado, let's um, go ahead and look at our text for today. So, last time I spoke, uh, I received a little bit of feedback that I'd not quite contextualised things as well as I normally do. And in case you're not familiar, and we do have visitors here today, at this church, we like to take a broad view (laughs) of Scripture, just for you, Mark. (laughs) So, (laughs) let me background a little on where this passage sits in Luke's Gospel. Luke's account is written as an investigative piece, compiled from eyewitness accounts and trustworthy sources. He tells us this in chapter 1. It's an action-packed account that moves swiftly, Although, it is important to remember that Luke is not trying to write a chronological history of events, as one might see if if a video had been recorded. Like any good historian, he's trying to highlight important points and make his reader think. So chapter 11, where our story comes from today, opens with Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray, including what is often known as the Lord's Prayer. He finishes this teaching by telling them that what they ask for, God will give them. As if to demonstrate this, Jesus then drives a demon out of someone who is mute and enables them to speak. Those present accuse him of doing so by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of evil, while others demand a sign from heaven, which seems kind of odd for me because that seems pretty convincing. Um, Jesus suggests that the only sign this generation will be offered is the mysterious sign of Jonah, raising the spectre of his impending death and resurrection. He then talks about the eye being the lamp of the body and that a healthy body is full of light. N.T. Wright notes that Jesus is not speaking about ocular health here, but about the light that drives away darkness, the light who is currently standing in their midst. It is a warning not to miss the sign. As he finishes this block of teaching, a Pharisee invites Jesus to dine with him. We should be aware that Luke has deliberately linked this body of teaching to what proceeds to happen during this meal. So, reading from Luke 11, uh, verses 37 onwards. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not clean his hands with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer before the meal. Got to make it contextually appropriate. Then the Lord said to him, Now... And now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs, but neglect justice and love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. 
So Jesus here enters this, uh, enters this house for dinner and he deliberately disregards the well-known purity laws. It is very unlikely that Jesus just had poor hygiene. He does this to elicit a response from the Pharisees and to make a point. Shows of piety and law-keeping are not what is required. Jesus concentrates on this theme throughout his teaching, especially when he speaks to the religious elite. Like when Jesus quotes Hosea in Matthew's Gospel, I desire chesed, not sacrifice. Similarly, in the well-known call from Micah 6, what does the Lord require from you? To act justly, to love chesed, and to walk humbly with your God. You might have noticed here that I've not used the word mercy, which many of you will be familiar with in these translations, uh, but instead the original Hebrew word chesed. I've never learnt Hebrew, and apologies to anyone who knows how to speak it properly. The Bible Project recently did a fascinating word study on chesed, and I will try not to be too nerdy here as I go into some of what they discuss, but I think it is quite relevant to what we're talking about here today. Chesed first appears in the book of Exodus and is mentioned among a list of words God uses to describe himself. God is the ultimate source and example of chesed. It is difficult to translate into English, but it is sometimes written as loyal love. The Bible Project notes, and I think we've got it on the screen for you, Chesed is a kind of love that you can depend on. When we long for love, what we are longing for is chesed. Affection can come and go, and it doesn't satisfy our innate need to be loved without condition. What we really want is a loyal affection, not driven by strict or begrudging obligation, but by deep compassion. When we treat someone as a close friend or family member, doing what is necessary to ensure their well-being and the health of the relationship, we call that an act of chesed. While the action may be an obligation or duty, chesed also refers to the emotional motivation of love that drives overabundant expressions of generosity and care. What Jesus dramatically responds to the Pharisees' complaint about his non-observance of purity laws is that they are failing to observe the key issues. They are polishing the outside of the cup while the inside is full of filth and disease. Rather than pursuing justice, they are seeking their own advancement. Rather than pursuing chesed or loyal love, their, uh, their relationships are transactional at best and destructive at worst. And worst of all, they drag others down with them. As Jesus states during a similar warning recorded in Matthew's Gospel, making others twice as much a child of hell as they are. This dinner party has got ugly really quickly. Let's continue with verse 45. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. I reckon that's a great line. Duh. Um, Jesus replied, And you experts of the law, woe to you, because you load down people with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. I did tell you it'd be heavy. N.T. Wright, in his commentary on this passage, points out that we often view the Pharisees as the religious elite. And this is true. However, to think of them like church leaders or pastors of our day paints an inaccurate picture. Wright points out that they held strong political beliefs which they backed up with religious sanctions. They were something like a moral police, forcefully urging Jewish people to follow their strict law code. Perhaps uh, the law code developed by the self-proclaimed experts far exceeded what is written in the Torah or what we call the Old Testament, but it included complicated and exhausting additions and interpretations that the people were made to follow. If people followed the law codes as dictated by the religious elite, Israel's glorious kingdom would at last arrive, or so they believed. These experts in the law that Jesus addresses here are even more invested in this as they are the ones prescribing the complex legal codes for the people to follow. Jesus' scathing critique of this system 
highlighted with this list of woes leaves us thinking, whoa. (laughs) It's not my joke, but I really like it. (laughs) No one else does. That's right. I said there's dad jokes here. You've got to embrace them. It's hard going. Have a chuckle. All right. It's important for us to consider that Jesus said all this, not just for the benefit of the Pharisees and experts of the law, but for a greater audience. Our reading of this here today is evidence enough of this. Jewish houses at the time were much more open, often with central courtyards and large windows. Given that all that had been going on on this particular day, it is likely that large crowds of people would have been gathered around the house, attentively listening to all that was being said. Imagine how you would feel as a poor farmer, labourer or fisherman, having long suffered under the weight of these increasingly strict and punitive laws to hear someone challenging them so openly. To hear him speak of justice for the poor, people like you. It could only have felt like a surge of fresh air filling your lungs. In an earlier section of Luke, sometimes thought of as Luke's Sermon on the Mount, he challenges the people, uh, sorry, he teaches the people a series of blessings and woes. The blessings are for the poor, the hungry, the grieving and excluded, for even they have a a place in Jesus' upside down new kingdom. But there are woes for the rich, the well-fed, those laughing and the famous, not that there is inherently wrong with anything, any of these things, uh, for they have accepted earthly treasures in place of the goodness God has to offer. In his list of woes, Jesus is sending a stark warning. Do not miss your opportunity. More than that, do not ruin the opportunity of others as you do. The message, message translation states... You're hopeless, you religion scholars. You took the key of knowledge and instead of unlocking doors, you locked them. You won't go in yourself and you won't let anyone else in either. Jesus states here that the blood of the prophets and others wrongly killed throughout Israel's history is going to be on the hands of this current generation. This seems harsh, even in spite of the corruption and lack of compassion exhibited by the religious elite. What Jesus is getting at here is that they keep missing the point. Rather than bringing freedom and life to people, they are weighing them down with burdens they can barely carry. Worst of all, they have the living one, the light of the world, standing before them, but they cannot see him. Like Jesus is teaching just prior to commencing this meal, their eyes can only see darkness. Although this comes across as harsh, abrupt and jarring, this is a warning to see the light, to respond to him, to shape their lives around Jesus' kingdom values of justice and hesed, not superficial displays of piety and personal advancement, stepping on others as they go. Just to finish our passage from today, uh, continuing from verse 53, when Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. This is not a beautiful meal with a happy ending. If he wasn't already, this meal places Jesus at number one on the Pharisees' most wanted list. The purpose of this series is to encourage us to meet together and to invite others to practice hospitality. The meal that Jesus attends, documented in Luke's gospel, are a tool, the meals that Jesus attends, documented in Luke's gospel, are a tool we're using to highlight this. I want to be upfront and say that try as I might, I found it difficult to extract a message of hospitality from this story. To be honest, Jesus seems like a pretty lousy house guest here. And I think if we leave our preconceptions at the front door, we feel a fair bit of sympathy for this Pharisee, whose name we aren't told, who has opened his home to Jesus only to be verbally eviscerated. However, I do believe that there are some important takeaways here, especially with regards to how we engage with each other. The first thing that really stands out to me in this text is that Jesus accepts an invitation to eat with people that hold very different views to himself and that he has been openly critical of. The notion of holding very different ideas and values to others is something we should all feel pretty familiar with. Polarisation seems to be more and more normal in our current environment. I've spoken about this before, but I continue to be confronted by how significant differences of, of, differences of opinion are becoming. I've been told by many people that they will no longer talk with or see certain members of family or friends because of their stance towards vaccines or masks or quarantines, etc. I read this week about a farmer in rural South Australia whose crops were almost totally destroyed by a recent hailstorm, the worst one he can remember. 
He related the increase in unusual weather events to climate change and stated that he could no longer asso with, associate with anyone who was a climate change skeptic. Maybe we think that if Jesus was here today, instead of going to the Pharisee's house, he would have crafted a clever Instagram post or blog piece, tearing down the Pharisee's position with a series of well-placed zingers. <laughs> a Twitter war would then follow where the lack of face-to-face -face engagement allows the kind of inappropriate speech and conduct that would really happen between two people sitting in the same room opposite each other. Jesus instead accepts a meal invitation fully aware that he is entering a hostile environment where there are going to be traps waiting for him. Perhaps the first thing we could learn from this story is to take the courage to sit with those we disagree with, to listen with compassion and a real desire to understand. This generally won't include bringing out a list of woes for your dinner mates. To highlight the need to sit with others, to listen and to try to understand may seem an odd choice. This is obviously not what Jesus does in this story. <laughs> That's true. Interestingly, as seen consistently through all four Gospels, the people that Jesus is most critical of, and the critique can get pretty fiery, is the Jewish religious leaders. Jesus' response to others instead is marked by love and compassion. These should be the principles that drive our interaction with others too. When we sit with others, especially those from outside of our church family, we can sometimes feel the need to point out their mistakes. We can read passages like the ones we have discussed here and take away the wrong message. We can start delivering our own versions of woes or paternalistic cond condescension that leaves people feeling angry and ashamed. In short, we can start to load others with a heavy weight. In a story repeated in a number of the Gospels, Jesus challenges the Pharisees on why, uh, Jesus, when challenged by the Pharisees on why he eats with tax collectors and sinners, states that it is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. This is, of course, another example of Jesus' verbal karate, as, as all of us are broken. It was only the tax collectors and prostitutes and so-called sinners who had sufficient insight to realise this. Perhaps then, true community over a dinner table looks like honesty and openness rather than false piety. As we sit with others, we have the courage to show that our cups, both inside and outside, are chipped and stained. The way we commune together can be an act of justice. One of the distinctions that marked the early church was that people from very different stations in life, slaves and slave owners, rich and poor, all met together over the same table practical acts of love and justice. As the barriers were broken down and people began to know one another, the early church also ensured that they financially and materially supported those who needed it. Unless we meet together in homes, preferably over food, we do not get the chance to truly know one another. Having coffee together after church is a wonderful thing, but it is rushed and it can be a difficult place to go deep. We come to know each other by spending time with one another, in each other's spaces, with each other's families. Life groups are an almost essential element of this process. It is through doing these things that we truly become family. Family comes with its own unique challenges, but belonging to a family, especially a loving family, is a wonderful thing. As we grow as a family in Jesus, as we get to know each other and as we care for each other, this also becomes a healing and restoring place to invite others into. Speaking of life groups, we had ours on Wednesday, just gone. I discussed with the group how I was wrestling with this teaching and especially how to kind of wrap it all up. And as we discussed a passage from John, Tam commented about her role working in preserving information and stories from the past. And as I reflected on this the next day, as I pedaled along to work, I realised both what is the final piece of this teaching and why sitting together is so important. It is that in the course of eating together, we are given the chance to tell our stories. Each night, Kim and I make a point, however difficult it may be, and believe me, some nights it would be easier to herd cats around our table, but we take a deep breath and we make a point of sitting together as a family to eat. And there are many benefits of such a habit, including the, pra uh, including the chance to practice gratitude and to bond as a family. But perhaps the most important is to catch up each other on the events of our individual days. This not only helps to understand where each of us is at, but builds the larger Findlay family narrative about who we are as a family and how we each belong and contribute. One of the key focuses of current medical research is isolation and loneliness. 
and there are varying definitions of, this, definitions of these terms. But for today, I want us to think of them as states where we don't have trusted companions to share our stories with. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare reports that between 2001 and 2009, one third of Australians experienced loneliness. Since the onset of COVID, 54% of respondents stated that they felt more lonely than in pre-pandemic times. Studies have linked loneliness to premature death and it is associated with markedly increased rates of heart disease, stroke and dementia, just to name a few. We feel lonely when we cannot connect with others in a meaningful and intimate way and we do this by telling our stories. As we share stories, both ours and others, old and new, and listen to other people's stories, we relate to each other's stories and feel the power of belonging. We start to find ourselves in a bigger story. The Bible Project describes the Bible as a unified story leading to Jesus. And I love this definition, or this description. But God's story for this world doesn't end at Jesus' birth, or his death, or his resurrection. But God's story continues on today. As Jesus shared with these Jewish leaders, he was giving them a chance to find themselves in the biggest story, albeit a little woefully. Think think about it. It's good. From Abel to Jonah to Zechariah and all the prophets, he is painting out the story they all knew so well and locating them in that story, even if this was uncomfortable for them. A story not focused on laws or achievements or prestige, but a story of God of the God of love bending low to heal creation. Jesus wants them to awaken to this truth, to see the light shining in the darkness and to stop blocking others from the light. The climax of the story was imminent and they couldn't see it. Like the Pharisees and legal experts, we too can get lost in our own stories. We not only become deaf to the stories of others, blunting our empathy and compassion, but we lose sight of the bigger story. The story in which we all have a role to play, no matter how small it might seem. As we meet and eat together over a table, we share stories, we build intimacy and we remind ourselves of who we are, who God is and what the true story is. In the spirit of storytelling, I want to end with another story about a meal from the book of Luke. It's it's not one we're going to cover in this series. You don't have to stress, Andrew. (laughs) I'm going to try my hand at retelling this story as we finish today. So if you like, you can close your eyes uh, and try to imagine yourself in this story. You walk along a dusty road in the late afternoon sun. Your heart is broken and the wound is incredibly fresh. You wrestle back and forth in conversation with your companion, trying to make sense of all that has happened. How can it be true? Were you mistaken all along? What hope is there for the future? You are both startled by the footsteps of an approaching stranger. He catches up to you and greets you both. He's smiling and you feel strangely comforted by his presence. Noticing your sadness, he asks, are you both okay? He asks about your conversation. You hesitate. There's been a lot of tension in the air lately. Is this man even safe to speak to? But he seems kind and he's clearly Jewish. So you, so you raise the obvious question. Are you the only one who doesn't know what just happened in the city? He looks at you straight-faced and replied, What happened? You're surprised by his ignorance, but you tell him about Jesus, the one everyone is talking about. You explain that you had hopes that he was the one sent by God to redeem Israel. He was clearly a man of God. His words were spellbinding and he had the actions to back it up. He did incredible wonders and changed people with the words he spoke. He was clearly blessed by God. But as tears again come to your eyes, you note that the Jewish leaders, your own people, betrayed him to the Roman oppressors and had him killed. Not just killed, but crucified, crucified of all the ways to die. Today, some of your friend's women had gone to the tomb to perform burial rites. It was three days since he died and given that his death had occurred on the eve of Passover, there was no time to properly prepare his body. These women had brought further confusion by saying that when they attended the tomb, his body was gone. More than that, there were strange beings, angels, the women said, who the women claimed told them that Jesus was alive. You didn't understand why these women were telling such horrible lies. Didn't they think everyone was sad enough already? At this, the stranger cut you off. 
not aggressively, but forcefully asking, don't you understand? Have you missed it? Have you never read the Scriptures? It seems like he haven't realised that the Messiah had to experience these sufferings so that he could fully and finally become the glorious one. You feel a little stung by his response, but also more than a little curious. Then the most incredible thing happened. You had heard great stories in the past. You'd seen brilliant plays and captivating speakers, but this was something beyond. The stranger began to speak about scriptures in a way you had never heard. Starting from the beginning like an expert guide, he brought out information about the Messiah that felt like intimate knowledge. This felt like a passion project for him. The only person you had ever heard teach like this was Jesus. Your tears dried up and you started to feel a strange feeling growing inside. Hope. As night was beginning to fall, you reached your destination. The stranger seemed like he was planning to go further, but you couldn't let him move on without eating with you. You wanted to show hospitality, but secretly you wanted any excuse to keep listening to what he had to say. He agreed, so you sat down at the table together. The stranger offered to bless the food and you readily accepted. He picked up some flat bread from the table. He gave thanks for it and handed you each a piece. What happened next is hard to describe. It was like the lights came on for the very first time. Like the darkness of the invading night was cast away into brilliant day. It was him. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Almost as suddenly he disappeared from the room. However, you really didn't mind because it was him. Everything you had hoped and dreamed for had come true. It was like the stories you had always heard now became clear in the setting of a bigger story. A story that included you, everyone you knew, and, well, everyone. What your ears had heard, you had not understood. What your eyes had seen, you couldn't recognise until you heard the story, until that fateful meal. Thank God for stories. Thank God for meals. May we practice sharing them both together and with others.